Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session on New Testament Survey, BC 103. Today, we would be studying on the letter to James. Um, sorry, uh, yeah, the, uh, the epistle of James. Um, before we could begin with our session, can I request uh, one of us to lead us in prayer? Anyone? Father, we want to thank you for this time, Lord. We submit us into your mighty presence, Lord, we, as we learn today. We pray, O oh God, that you would open the eyes of our understanding and help us to know more about your word, about you. We also submit Pastor Diana into your hands, O oh God. We pray that you would anoint her to deliver your word to us, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We submit us once again. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Okay, so today we're going to study on the on the book of James, which is the book of practical Christianity. It is also known as the book of practical Christianity. And the, the summary of this book goes like this, where unbelievers, now a pillar of the church, who are very pious, devote. Um, he was actually an unbeliever. He never believed Jesus because maybe many reasons related to that but then now he's become the pillar in the jerusalem church and he's become very pious he's become a devout man and um, he's a man of good character and truly he lived the doctrine that he preached so uh, he writes to the Jewish Christians who are scattered among the nations because of persecution. He is trying to encourage them during this time of suffering. And he also addresses various issues related to faith. We also see that um, this letter is written between the time period of 41 to 50 AD, probably from the Jerusalem church so this letter is like a sermon notes on various topics and is practical rather than doctrinal yes it also surprised me knowing that just five chapters but so much to learn from this book so the main theme that we see in this letter is the practical religion manifesting itself in good works contrasted with profession of profession of faith. So before we could move ahead, let us know the person, the author of this book. Who is he? Who is James? So the name James is the English form of the word Jacob. So in Greek, it means Jacobos. So this name is to be uh, uh, this name is to be from, uh, you know, uh, distinguished from the other men by the name of James in the New Testament. So there are different James. So J one of the James was the James, the son of Zebedee, or James the Great, where we read in Matthew chapter 4, 21. In today's session, I would request all of us to take turn and uh, um, read Okay, so I would request, uh, please keep, um, please turn to the epistle of James in your Bible so that we all can take turns to read the scripture so that we can understand better and we can actively participate in the class. Okay, so we are talking about the different James from the Bible. We have one James, the son of Zebedee, or James the Great. Uh, um, and then the second person was James, the son of Alphaeus or James the Less, where we read about him in Mark chapter 15. And the third is James, the son of Mary and Joseph, the half-brother of Jesus. He is sometimes referred to as James the Just in historical literature. And we are going to study about this James. And he is the author of this letter. And he was most likely the eldest son of Mary and Joseph and the brother of Jesus. So how do we know that? Can I request one of us to please turn to Matthew chapter 13, verse 55 to 56. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 
chapter 13 verses 55 isn't this the carpenter's son isn't this the mother's name mary and aunt his brother brother james joseph simon and judas aren't yes. all okay that's it thanks thanks just to relate the scripture and can one of us also turn to mark chapter 6 verse 3 Mark six, chapter six, verse three. Mark chapter six, verses three. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't his mother's son and brothers of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Yes, thank you. There is also another verse in Galatians chapter one verse nineteen. It reads like this: "But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother." Okay, so there are different scriptures confirming that James was the half brother of Jesus. We also see the other siblings' name listed here. Who are who are those? Some of the version says his name was Joseph. possibly named as joseph as what even sid read from his translation the other brothers named as simon judas uh, we also see that the writer of book of jude and then unnamed sisters are bit listed and he was not numbered among the 12 apostles of the lamb and he did travel with jesus on various occasions with his other brothers we see that in many of the gospels or in the gospel of john where it clearly says that you know he traveled um uh, and also he and his brothers were not totally convinced about jesus calling and um mission in the early days of jesus ministry like uh, if i could request one of us to turn to john chapter 7 John chapter seven, verse three to five. John chapter seven, verses three to five. Yeah. Jesus' brother said to him, "You ought to leave here and go to Judea, so that your disciples." me see the miracle you do 3 to 5 okay no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret since you are doing these things show yourself to the world for these things for even his own brothers did not believe in him therefore yeah. that's it thank you so much so what we see here is even his brothers were not convinced totally with the calling of Jesus they didn't believe the ministry of Jesus initial of the days and later we see that he was uh, James he was attentive to the teaching of Jesus which is reflected in his uh, knowledge of the sermon on the mount and we also see in John chapter 19 verse 25 to 27 John chapter Gospel of John, chapter nineteen, verse twenty-five to twenty-seven. Anyone have turned to it? Can read. Ma'am, it's chapter nine or nineteen. Sorry, chapter nineteen, verse twenty-five to twenty-seven. Thanks, Sid, for correcting. John chapter nineteen, verses twenty-five. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, "Dear woman, here is your son." And to the disciple, "Here is your mother." From that time on. the disciples took her into his home thank you so what we see here is though he received 
Jesus teaching in later part, but he was absent at the cross at the time of Jesus crucifixion. So James was not present near the cross and he was one of the first to receive the message of Christ's resurrection. Can I request uh, yeah, one of us to please turn to John chapter 20, Gospel of John chapter 20 verse 17. Jafina, can you also turn? I request you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 5 to 7. If anyone have turned to John chapter 20, verse 17, you can start. John 20, 17. Yes. Jesus, Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your and your father and to my God and your God. Amen. Thank you. So what we see here is he was one of the first to receive the message of Christ's resurrection. And uh, can I also request one of you all to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 5 to 7. Jeffina, if you have turned to, can I request you to read? Okay, if anyone else have turned. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 5 to 7. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles, at last he appeared to me and uh, and as to abnormally born. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. So what we see here is he had personal encounter. We see that James had a personal encounter with the risen Christ sometime later. We also see that in Acts chapter 1 verse 14 that he was uh, in the upper room. In, uh, you know, waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We also see in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 18 to 19, we see that he was referred to by Paul as an apostle. And later in the book of Acts, uh, we see that he eventually uh, ascended to the senior leadership position in the Jerusalem church. And he was a senior pastor, a senior leader in the Jerusalem church. And he was instrumental in writing the degrees sent out in letters uh, formed to the Gentile churches from Jerusalem council. We also see that um, in book of James chapter 1 verse 1, it reads like this, James, a born servant of God and of Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greetings. So what we see here is that he achieved the high status of that of a born servant of Jesus Christ. Look at the understanding, the revelation that he started to have in Jesus, the one who did not believe in him in initial of his days or when Jesus was alive, but later part you know, he started believing. He started having a personal encounter with Jesus. No more he related Jesus as his brother, but then he started relating as the son of God. And we also see that the tradition suggests that he died as a martyr at the hand of the Jews. So what is the background of this book? Who were the audience of this book? To whom was this letter addressed to? Anyone from the class, would you like to share? Who were the audience? I'm sorry, there's some sound coming from outside. There's some carpenter work happening around. So we see the audience here is, uh, James identifies the audience as being the 12 tribes, which we just read, uh, who are scattered abroad just like the Jacob of the Old Testament had a word for his 12 natural sons. The New Testament Jacob will have a word for the spiritual Israel of 
God. So some have suggested that he was writing to the natural Israelites of the um, uh, of the people who lived there. However, when we study the content of the book, there is no question that he was not writing to the unbelievers, but then to the believers. He is most likely writing to the uh, spiritual Israel of God. He is writing to the believers in the Gentile regions. More specifically, he could have been writing to the members of his own congregation who had moved away from Jerusalem or had been dispersed through various persecution that had occurred in the Jerusalem. So on what occasion he is addressing, um, little has been known about the reason why James wrote this book, except that as a pastor, he was concerned, uh, caring of those who were um, caring for those under his spiritual influence, whether they were local or abroad. So, from where uh, uh, the date of writing, as I said, it was between 41 to 50 AD, and most scholars place this writing of this book uh, was a spread of the gospel to the Gentile world and what was the main message or we see the central message of this book is the book of James is that Christianity cannot be just a confession of lips it cannot be based on statement of faith alone but then Christianity must be authenticated by the way we live our lives so James is just not only telling to the people who lived in those, uh, I mean, in his time, but then it also applies to us. This letter is more alive to us, asking us just not to live our life with only a uh, confession of our lips, but then make it a living, make it a lifestyle. So we also see through this letter, James is emphasizing the practical nature of Christianity and the necessary connection between faith and works. So this is also seen in James' writings where, uh, when we turn to James chapter 1, can I request all of us to turn to James chapter 1, verse 27. Can I request one of you all to read? James chapter 1, verse 27. Okay, maybe we can read from 26 to 27. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Yeah, thank you. So what we see here, we see that in this section, James deals with a self-deception that can occur when we think that we know the truth. And, you know, and it is the same thing that as practicing the truth, we need to apply it in our life. And we have to do more than just the talk talk, but a religion must reach the practical side of our life. It must become a lifestyle. And he also says in James chapter 4, 17, he says, therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. Very clearly he says, to him, who knows to do good and does not do it. To him, it is sin. He also goes further. Can I request you all to turn to chapter 2, verse 20 to 21. James chapter 2, verse 20 to 21. Verse 20, but do you, do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Thank you. Thank you, John. So what we see in this section, James is making it clear that faith is just not enough. 
one must authenticate their faith with action. So it must correspond into action. His confession and his work should go along. So James almost seems to be saying the opposite of Paul writing. Or is it so? Is he saying something opposite to what Paul said? No. No, it is the same. So in the Romans, we see that Romans chapter 4, verse 2 to 3, we see that for if Abraham was justified by works, he was something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. We also read in the gospel of John, verse 8, sorry, chapter 8, verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So here we're seeing that all the apostles also emphasizing on faith should go along with works. It should not just be the profession of only lips, but it should correspond to our action. Can I request one of us to turn James chapter 2, verse 14? Verse 14. Yes. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Yeah. Can uh, we like to compare this scripture with 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9? And the other person turned to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9. If one of us have to turn to Second Timothy chapter one verse nine. Second Timothy, brother Isaac, would you like to turn to Ephesians chapter two verse eight to nine? And also others, yeah. Second Timothy chapter one verse nine: Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, but not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Amen. Anyone else have turned Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 to 9? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Amen. Amen. So in all these scriptures, we see that they go hand in hand and it also emphasizes that don't look at only your works, but give glory to God. Yes, we need to have faith. It has to correspond with the action, but in everything, glorify God in it so that we don't boast with our own work. But then it is the grace of God who enables us to do it. We cannot do anything with our own effort, but it is only through grace of God. So at all areas, give glory to God. And faith is something that we receive from God and we apply it in action. We also um, see that the same teaching, whatever Paul has taught is what even James has been teaching. They all uh, teach the same doctrine, same word, same gospel they preach. So what is the unique feature of this letter? James has a pastoral concern. So there is, um, there is no question that James uh, is a pastor, but he sees and addresses all of the issues that pastors have to face every day uh, when he was working with people who are not living a victorious or a, a victorious life or not living as a matured believer. So he is addressing certain issues in this letter concerning the uh, practical side. And he is uh, also addressing them and he's concerned about them and he would like to correct them and, you know, um, 
he wants to see them grow matured just like how paul had this passion to the people uh, in the places where he planted the church so we see uh, paul uh, sorry james addressing on certain issues in this letter like how to handle the temptation or handling the riches hearing and doing it so important you know uh, we shouldn't just be uh, uh, the person of just talks but then we need to apply it in our action and he also uh, talks about dealing with prejudice or faith and works uh, especially he also talks about taming the tongue and how important it is to walk in wisdom and he also talks about dealing with carnality or cultivating patience is so important in the ministry we also see james knowledge of the sermon on the mount where um he talks about uh, you know the whole book of james deals with the application of the sermon on the mount to the local church setting like uh, we see uh, three points he addresses under moses god laid out the laws for the children of israel and god's covenant of people of the old testament on mount sinai he also addresses uh, about jesus god laid out the law so of the kingdom relating to the new testament on the sermon on the mount and he also says um with james is saying god laid out how the laws of the kingdom apply to the church the spiritual israel of god he also address about the temptation issues uh, in this letter so he gives us a clear presentation of the process of temptation found in the bible uh, and also with the view to help the believers how we can overcome so he is talking about man has been tempted uh, he, he shares about uh, in in the book of genesis how he was tempted and later how david was tempted by seeing a woman and also he addresses about uh, arkan in the book of joshua how he was tempted looking at the spoils at a war and uh, he also warns about being enticed by our own lust so he again shares the three example about eve david and akan like combined with the desires within it can arouse sexual arousal or uh, uh, you know uh, being tempted when uh, the eyes for the things that you desire so he is warning on different areas where if uh, when we are tempted when we allow the temptation how it can uh, you know create a desire and this desire that when we allow it it gets conceived in our heart and once it is conceived how would um, you know uh, how it um, relates us uh, with an action uh, it gives birth to sin our action leads to sin and and then the sin has been accomplished when we allow it so at the first part itself like how paul says when when we are tempted at the very start itself when we rebuke it try to overcome at the first place itself so we will not uh, be we will not be led into sin okay so he is just warning and he is giving us an idea how when we allow how a simple temptation can lead to sin okay and he also talks about the heroes of the old testament so who are there uh, he talks about abraham uh, because he was a man who verified his faith by his works we also see uh, james talk about isaac uh, how abraham prepared him as a sacrifice and in, and it was an ultimate example of work verifying with faith we also see james addresses rahab as seen as someone who demonstrated her faith by her action which resulted in her salvation we also see james talk about job is seen as a man of perseverance through suffering we also see elijah he addresses elijah as a man who knew how to pray and believe god for the impossible and here uh, james is encouraging us to be like abraham to be like rahab despite our past or be like job in midst of suffering and be like elijah a man of prayer and then trust god believe him for the impossibilities 
yes it is a greater revelation or a reminder for each of us how we can stir this faith within us as paul writes in romans faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of god the more and more we hear that's one of the reason why continuously we see the disciples emphasize on the work of god they remind us from the old testament how god was faithful what god can do in different situations so this is one of the thing like how faith can be generated by hearing and hearing the word of god so the more and more we hear about god the impossibilities that god could do in each one's life we can apply it in our own life in our own situation because we serve a god who's living we serve the god who desires to minister to each one of us personally and we also should know that he is a living god and who's living inside of each one of us and here we go to the go back to the book of james where he uh, he, descri- he describes a description of the tongue where every pastor should know that the greatest enemy of the local church is disunity and he also talk about the greatest cause for disunity is the misuse of the tongue and here we see in this letter that james describes the power that the tongue can have for both good and evil i'm talking about uh, chapter 3 verse 1 to 12 in the book of james where the tongue is like um, you know he compares it it is like the bit in the horse mouth yes it is a small thing but it can control a large animal and he also says the tongue is like a rudder on a large ship it is very small by comparison but it can control the directions of the entire ship he also goes further and he says that tongue is a spark of fire it may seems insignificant but then we know it has the potential to destroy the entire forest he also says the tongue is more difficult for man to tame than the wild animal you know why because it to do something within himself so it's not impossible but then with god all things are possible we also see the tongue can be just like the venom of a snake that when injected it can kill its prey james is also talking about the tongue which is like a spring of water when it is pure it produces life but when it is tainted it brings forth death it is so very important isn't it awakening to us what he's talking about when it is pure it produces life we are life giving people we are to encourage we are to empower people we are here to build people let our tongue be pure because when it's pure it can produce life we also see the book of proverbs 18:21 it says death and life is in the power of your of your can anyone complete that verse tongue tongue so you shall have what you say you shall bear the fruit of what you produce out of your mouth it is very very important so james is not saying something new he is just emphasizing the scriptures again and again so that you know we realize we are ministered we can correct we can empower ourselves as a leader he is the leader of the jerusalem church he is giving us the importance as a leader what we need to do he also goes further and he says the tongue is like a fruit tree or a vine from which people can eat it can be a tree of life or of death again emphasizing on proverbs 18:21 the power of tongue we should be like this we should be we should have a tongue that is pure that can produce life we should uh, be uh, we should have a tongue that can bear good fruit 
which can also be contagious and which can which has the power to multiply 100 30 60 can we tame ourselves to have a tongue that is pure which can bring life and also this book a learning from this book should be the faith which corresponds with action even during the time of trials or even when we have been treated poor, even when we have been looked down by others. I'm sure James been the leader in the Jerusalem church. It is very nice for us to call him that way. James being the leader of the Jerusalem church. He was the main person um, uh, in the council. But then we should also know the other side of, you know, the persecution that you would have faced from the Jewish people or from the other leaders around him. But he's saying in midst of that, hold on to your faith. Let faith produce action. So what we speak here is look up to God. Trust him in all situations. Just like the other disciples, like Paul, Peter, uh, you know, um, he's asking us to hold on to Jesus. In times of trial, look up to him. And he was the man uh, who was martyred. Even, uh, even uh, he did not give up on his faith even till his death. Just like Paul and other disciples. So today, when we study this letter, can we look how well do our action reflect the faith we proclaim in our life? Is our faith is corresponding to the action? Is our tongue been tamed? Are we having, are we like the spring of water? Are we like the life-giving fruit? Are we bearing good fruit? We need to look. And right now, I keep this session open. Uh, if there's anyone in our class who would like to add, share, please feel free to unmute and you know share your learning. Or is there something that you would like to add to this letter? P please feel free so that we all could learn together. I think it's interesting to see uh, how James brings all Testament characters, as we mentioned, um, uh, including uh, Job and also Elijah, uh, the, uh, how they uh, operated in faith and how we can make them as an example uh, and, uh, and to practice that faith in our lives. I think it's quite interesting, as uh, we mentioned in the class. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Brother Abu Bakr, you would like to add? Brother Isaac, Zeli, Brother Subhashish, Anita, anyone? What was your learning or is there anything that you would like to add to this letter so we all can learn together? There's so much more to speak. But then I just prepare the class for 15 minutes, what we could, uh, the important points that we could discuss, learn from this letter together. Okay, I see complete silence. So I understand that it's clear and we can, yes, yes, brother, please go ahead. Uh... <clears throat> I wanted to add something, one about his death, about the death of James, yes. and uh, about the, the works being talked about here. Number one, about death, he was put on the same pinnacle where the devil put, put Jesus Christ, and he was pushed off that pinnacle of, of Jerusalem, and he did not die. They tried to stone him, still he didn't die, and somebody out of pity mercy, put a club on his on his head and he breathed his last. But when he was 
uh, looking hard at his dead body, they found that his knees had had been mar they were they were more like those the legs of a horse. That means the, that he was always on his knees. He he lived most of his life on his knees most of his time. So and the reason they called him they called him Jose James the Just because he was a very honest man. Whenever his your case would reach him, uh, he would always give the best opinion as far as scripture and what he was concerned. Number two, about his works, about the works being mentioned here, we might be confused with the, what Paul says in Romans that it is by faith alone but not works, but here what they talk about the faith, I mean, the works that Christians need to do are the acts of compassion, being kind to each other, welcoming. Just as Jesus Christ said that if you come to me and you say, Lord, Lord, how did I mistreat you or what and what? So it really means that formally the, the, the works were on Tuano's body, whereby you needed to be circumcised, you needed to keep the Sabbath, you needed, but after the cross, the acts of compassion, the acts of, uh, those acts of compassion you do to others, because it's not on to yourself only, much as you have to live a just life, but you also have to do most of what you do for others, just as Christ also died for us on the cross. That's what I have to say, teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Lubega. You briefed about certain very important points, like about his death and also one of the character of James, which was very well known, is about, you know, he was also nicknamed saying that the old camel knees because of the clauses that he had developed while kneeling in prayer. So he was known as a man of prayer where he used to kneel and pray and he developed that clause and he was nicknamed as old camel knees. Yeah. Anyone else would like to add? Thank you, Brother Lupega. Anyone else would like to add? Okay, so we all are very clear on this letter. Let's emphasize uh, certain things from this letter is to be a man of just, to be a man of prayer. Uh, it is good for us to pray on knees. Uh, somewhere I read like uh, the knee mails are answered, uh, you know, uh, fervently. Um, so knee mails are good. Good to kneel and pray and see God. And yes, faith with actions is very important. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's tame our tongue. Let our words be pleasing. Let our words be gentle. Let our words bear fruit. Let it be like a fru fruit bearing tree. Uh, let it encourage and build others. So our words should be to build others. Okay, because we are uh, the ambassador of Christ. We reflect him in our life. And what is within you is what comes out. So within us is God. So his words, his nature, his character should reflect in and through us. Um, so with that, we will end this session. Can I request one of us to please dismiss us in a word of prayer? As we studied, can I request Zeli if you can pray? Yes, sure, Pastor. Yeah. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful session, learning from the book of James, Lord. Whatever particular lessons that we have learned, Holy Spirit, you enable us so that, Lord, uh, you will enable us to live a victorious Christian life, Lord, taming our tongue and also doing the works of Jesus and walking by faith. And also, Lord, help us, Lord, 
Oh, hallelujah. Father, you bless each one of us and also you bless our pastor who has uh, uh, taught us uh, this morning, Lord. Bless our pastor. Bless each one of us, Lord. And Holy Spirit, continue to guide us, lead us throughout the day, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Zeli, for praying. And thank you, each one, for joining into our session. God bless. Have a great week. See you all next session, next Monday. Thank you. God bless.